I think it's 11 o'clock, so I think we can start, right? So um, welcome, everybody. My name is Marian Otel, and I'm HP Cloud Services Technical Sales for Europe, and I would like to welcome you to this talk called OpenStack to Enterprise, Keep Calm and Boldly Go. I'm not sure how many of you um, here in the room were present at the uh, last design summit, but uh, during that summit, my friend and colleague, uh, Pete Johnson, gave a talk entitled uh, Enterprise to OpenStack, Here's what you're missing. And uh, during that talk, um, Pete went through all the features and functionality that we have been hearing from our enterprise customers that OpenStack is missing and thus uh, preventing larger uh, adoption of OpenStack by those customers. The purpose of, uh, in the meantime, uh, Again, six months ago, things moved very, very fast, and the technology has made tremendous effort in overcome many of those objections. However, uh, life is never perfect, and we will ever hear some sort of object objections in some way, shape, or form of why things are not happening. So the purpose of this talk, like the cheesy title suggests, is, a share of some, is an answer to that talk and that presentation, uh, in, uh, and share some of the lessons that we have learned in how to position OpenStack uh, to our enterprise customers and how do we overcome uh, those uh, objections in practice. Uh, before I even uh, go into the presentation, a few uh, kind, word, uh, uh, kind words of warnings and biases, um, like the uh, name of the, this track suggests, which is business value, um, this presentation is not about technology. Right here at the summit, we're very fortunate to have very deep technical sessions out there. Um, this is not one of them. This is about OpenStack making hard, cold business sense. Uh, the second one is that uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but this will not be a glitzy PR marketing exercise will, where I will have enterprise customer uh, coming on the stage and telling us how wonderful life is with OpenStack and how they have seen the light. This is unfortunately real nitty gritty, ungl unglamorous real life example that uh, we have learned uh, uh, during the two years that we have uh, been uh, using OpenStack. And on that, it's a, a bias warning. Um, again, as I'm working for HP Cloud Services, which uh, as you may know, is one of the largest OpenStack-based uh, uh, public cloud service providers out there, my talk will ha has a natural uh, cloud service provider uh, bias to it. While I will try to address other OpenStack usage and environments, uh, again, that sort of bias will shine through. So again, you have been warned. Uh, last but not the least, I'm a very big fan of Hugh McLeod cartoons and Gaping Void, and we will see quite a few of them uh, coming up. So before we delve a bit deeper, uh, a quick level set. Does anybody in this room not recognize who this guy is? So anybody who doesn't know who this guy is, quick show of hands. One. Thank you. So for those of you who don't know, this is Jeffrey Moore, and he's a well-known venture capitalist from Silicon Valley. And uh, Jeffrey Moore wrote this book called Crossing the Chas. In this book, uh, Jeffrey Moore um, illustrates the process called diffusion of innovation, which is a process uh, first uh, researched and identified uh, by a guy no named Everett Rogers, which showed that the, the rate uh, a technology or quote unquote innovation is adopted in the marketplace follows very distinct patterns, in, namely that the, uh, it is adopted in a bell-shaped curve and the adoption goes through very distinctive phases of types of uh, people who are adopting the technology. Uh, and what Jeffrey Moore showed in his book is that, uh, and relevant to our uh, uh, subject in OpenStack, is that when we are marketing a particular technology, we need to be very mindful of the different types of customers that are in the market. In particular, uh, 
the fact that between what we have there on the left are, are the early adopters and visionaries and the mainstream market are fundamental qualitative differences that uh, we need to be very mindful of. Hence the term CHASP and how do we cross it. Second quiz, and I'll try to make this easier. Anybody who doesn't know who this person is? Quick show of hands. Okay, so Professor Christensen seems to be a bit more uh, famous, and I even make it easy, put his name in the back. This is Professor Clayton Christensen, and he wrote this book, which is actually a series of books, but uh, um, arguably this, this is the first and arguably the, uh, the, the best in, in the series. And what Professor Christensen showed uh, was that he an analyzed how different technologies uh, um, and in quote unquote innovations are adopted. And he came out to the uh, conclusion that there are fundamentally two types of innovation. One which is called a sustaining innovation, namely making an existing technology better, so better, faster, cheaper. And a different type which is, excuse me, uh, called disruptive innovation, which is a new technology or a technology which is used in novel environments or in new ways. And uh, he analyzed the dynamics between the two. So if we delve a bit deeper into that and we use uh, Professor Christensen's uh, innovation model uh, and we see that the technological progress due to uh, sustaining innovation and technological progress due to uh, disruptive innovation and the uh, marketplace being a barrel-shaped curve on the right side. And you might, might venture a guess where exactly OpenStack would be on the horizontal axis. Any guesses? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would argue uh, that uh, we are, based on our experience, somewhere between point A and point B. In other words, OpenStack as a technology that is today, it is an emerging technology that is a low end disruption that appeals to some sort of customers, but not necessarily so to a large group of many others that are out there. So how do we position OpenStack to enterprise, which by definition, again, are very large customers, and uh, like Jeffrey Moore showed, it's a very large majority of out there. So one way of how not to do it is this, right? When we go into a large shop or a very large shop and we see that uh, after some analysis and discussions, we realize that their technology their process, the culture, the whole thing is dying and they will die the horrible, painful death they will deserve to die. We don't necessarily quite put it that way to them, right? Because it doesn't help you and far, far more importantly, it just annoys them, right? Because as the joke goes, in the long run or in the very long run, we are all dead. It's all about times and timelines. <laughs> and how do, we, how do we position when and in which terms, right? So um, if this is not the way to do it, how, what's, what's, how do we do it? So let's uh, take a bit more serious look and um, make the parallel between uh, OpenStack and Linux. And again, it's a dreaded comparison, uh, but uh, what I mean by that, it's purely as a low-end disruption uh, platform, right? And I'm not sure you have seen uh, Sark, uh, um, keynote session this morning when they've done the same parallel between Linux uh, and OpenStack and how the adoption uh, 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 proceeded in the marketplace. If we are making that parallel, how Linux was uh, adopted by the mainstream market uh, and we, we focus only on how Linux was adopted uh, on the desktop. Uh, anybody remember that this will be the year of the Linux on the desktop meme? Right? How many years we heard that? By the end, at the end, the, the answer was it will be the same year that Duke Nukem Forever will be released. Right? And the year that it was released, it was so outdated by the standards of the day that the only people who bought it was only for nostalgic reasons. Right? So what I would argue that what had to happen for Linux to be adopted by the mainstream market was that Android had to happen. 
In other words, it took a vendor like Google, take a platform, bundle it with the hardware, but far more importantly, with the use case and the application, and offer it in an end-to-end -end value proposition that appealed to the marketplace. In other words, made the underlying platform irrelevant, make it and address all the concerns about security, manageability, affordability, and so on, and offer a value proposition based on that platform. And in other words, the, the platform was only the enabler. And to me, if you, if I, when I watch uh, uh, Jonathan ke uh, keynote yesterday, I absolutely loved the uh, examples that, uh, that we had with uh, Best Buy and Comcast. Anybody noted that during that bl uh, uh, blinking lights, was there any sign of OpenStack? To me, there wasn't, right? And that's exactly the whole point, right? The underlying platform was made irrelevant, right? As long as it fitted for, pur for purpose, it only enabled downstream value, agility, how they go to market, how they do things, and so on and so forth. So it, it was only the underlying platform was only as an enabler, as a, depends on how you look at it, downstream or uh, higher level uh, value based on that platform. And before you argue that uh, Linux has very little to do with Android, I would say that's absolutely right. It has as much as OS X has to do with FreeBSD, right? The underlying platform is irrelevant as long as it sustains a very clearly articulated use case and application and environment. So let's um, delve a bit deeper into that. If we turn to Je Jeffrey Moore uh, himself, um, he points, he points, makes a very clear point in his book that applications have much easier time to cross the chance, in other words, be adopted by the mainstream market than platforms, ergo OpenStack and Linux, for the very simple reasons that applications can be articulated in terms of end user need. He goes even further to say that to accelerate the adoption of platforms, and that is a li literally quote, if to accelerate the adoption of platforms, the vendors must clothe them in applications clothing. Or the way that I like to joke about it, in the wise words of London underground train operators, please mind the gap between the application as, and the platform as you board this train. <laughs> right, so how do we do that? So even if we manage to take a platform like OpenStack, articulate in terms of applications and, and user needs, and try to position in an enterprise, we run into this problem. Namely that enterprises, by their very definition, are large, very large, or humongous organizations, and as such, very slow to change. Or putting it differently, due to sheer physics, change takes a very long time to propagate through all, throughout the whole organization. So even if we have uh, end user and we empower end users, and these users have the authority and the capability to drive that change, by and large, or at the very least, to a, a, a good extent, they are prisoners of the system itself, right? So if we position that, we risk going into this problem. And namely that if we take a platform, articulate in terms of end user needs, who are able to uh, drive the adoption in the organization at large, we uh, have a very high risk into having a technology for technology's sake. Uh, uh, a pitfall, as I would like to call it. In other words, technology is accepted somehow grudgingly by the enterprise, by the, uh, by, or the organization, and it starts spinning, and people are doing things, and they do stuff with it for personal career reasons, for just, just playing with technology, or any other non-business reasons out there, right? And this is the point that Jeffrey Moore makes very clear in, it, in, in his book, that when that, uh, we have to be very mindful of that risk. And what we need to do is that when we articulate that uh, value, we have to have a very clear roadmap uh, with milestones. And at each milestone have the buy-in in terms of commercial commitment from the organization at large in, and have closure uh, behind that so we can move on to the next phase. However, believe it or not, that's still not enough. Well, for these particular reasons. Because if we take a platform, articulate in terms of, end, in terms of applications and end user needs that have the capability to 
uh, and authority to drive change with clear business value, we need to be very careful how we articulate that. Because what, will ha what happens is that the ruling orthodoxy, or what I like to call the corporate antibodies, will realize at some level of consciousness the disruptive potential that this innovate or low end disruption pose to the status quo, and they have a natural survival response. In other words, try to kill it before it even has a chance to prove itself. Or the more insidious uh, version of it, namely co-adopted and diverted to their own needs and pervert their the, the direction that the technology is driving, right? And what, what we need to do in that case is that we need to be very mindful of that and we need to use terms and vocabulary that the uh, uh, ruling orthodoxy, to put it that way, accepts and understands. And then we need to be, uh, we are very careful of seeing how, what, which narratives and which terms are used to be those ideas to be played back to us. The reason for that is that when that narrative changes, that's a mental signal that the mentality has changed and the uh, stoplight has switched to green and we can push further on, of course, until the next stop, which then we have to do it again. So enough with uh, uh, theoretical examples uh, and let me go to a particular, uh, with uh, concrete examples that we are using. So. Here are uh, just a straight out uh, uh, excerpt of the use cases that we are enabling on our platform. And in a uh, particular case with uh, the partners, with our ecosystem partners, which are enabling particular use cases. So we have an archiving and backup and collaborations with uh, uh, people like uh, Panzura, Riverbed, dat database and archiving, uh, data sacks, Mepar, Cassandra, Hadoop, the g all, that, all the stuff that you would expect to be there. Uh, plat uh, uh, platform as a service from like uh, Giga Spaces, uh, Cloudify from our dear friends from Giga Spaces, um, Cloud Bursting, which was <laughs> mentioned by Saar this morning, which is uh, fundamentally uh, a way to instantiate workloads either on the existing technology that's exi that uh, uh, on existing hardware that is on site and uh, or in uh, other capacity uh, resources that uh, are out there. Or for example, uh, uh, an example which is, uh, to me is very telling is enterprise Dropbox, right? So for me, the, the reason that this uh, example, and again, the, uh, the name of the innocents were uh, removed uh, from the slide uh, is that uh, we're seeing enterprising uh, realizing the viral adoption of uh, technologies like Dropbox and because they have uh, clear business reasons why they need to have some sort of manageability around this because they have governance risk and compliance reasons and if they don't do that they go to jail, right? They need to try to manage that while at the same time, they need to navigate the fact that their end users are voting with their credit cards and tell them to just get out of the hell out of the way because they can get the resources somewhere else without the six months overhead that IT has, right? So they need to manage this delicate balance be be between staying out uh, uh, of the way of the end users and just uh, uh, not be a hinder while at the same time having some sort of governance, some sort of manageability in place, right? And that, that to me is a very nice example of how people are trying and using technology to do that, right? And OpenStack with use cases to try to navigate that uh, stormy waters. Now, um, a few words of warning. What we have seen is that with uh, such a, with a technology like OpenStack that is changing such a rapid pace, uh, the, the, ra the rate of mortality among all those use cases of an application is very, very high. So even if we enable uh, 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 two dozens of use cases and application on our platform, uh, due to sheer physics and the way that the dynamics of the process, we will get fraction, we will have the, we're having the 80-20 split, right, in popular vernacular more potentially said the long tail distribution where any real traction is actually from a, a sm very s small or a very small set of use cases 
and uh, customers with a long trail of other stuff that's out there. So speaking about a great idea, let me tell you another great idea, how to get rich quick or how to pull an Android in seven easy steps, right? We take OpenStack, <laughs> we add our secret sauce, uh, we QA that on a set of reference architectures. From there on, we deploy into production, whatever production means to you. From there on, pushed out to a large mass of overjoyed customers, the lesson that you learn, you contribute back to OpenStack, but please not forget to keep the secret sauce, right? And what this process, we, we are uh, joking about what this process, this continuous integration, continuous process shows is that we are having a tight coupling between end users of the technology and the technology itself. And this is, a book, this is a point that Jeffrey Moore uh, um, makes in his book very clearly in the fact that for such emerging technology, for low-end disruption, we have to have a very clear and conscious focus on a small subset of customers and use cases that we are following uh, and enabling on our platform. The reason for that is that because the, due to the dynamics of the mainstream market is and everybody's looking for the big name marquee before they jump into the pool themselves, right? Somebody else has to jump first. Having recommendations and having some sort of footprint that we can use to bootstrap the rest of, the, of that particular uh, segment is uh, very important. And this was uh, dealt a bit more into um, an article from Harvard Business Review from January 1993 by Tracy and Birzema. Uh, which turned into a book. And in the article, in the book, uh, what they showed, what Tracy and Vizema showed, was that there are fundamentally three different areas that an organization or a company can uh, focus. Uh, the first one is uh, operational excellence, which as the name suggests, is improving our internal operations and efficiency to make sure that we are uh, structured in the best way possible to address a particular market. The second one uh, is uh, a product leadership, which is, again, as the name obviously says, is having the best product for that particular market and that particular segment that we are pursuing uh, and customer intimacy. In other words, having a very tight coupling between the technology and the customer. <coughs> and based on our experience, I would argue that customer we learned the hard way that customer intimacy was the most important to us. So while trying to do what the cartoon says uh, and try to hug your customer every day, might not be so popular or even get you a restraining order, for such a uh, fast evolving technology, uh, what it, in having a very uh, clear uh, uh, focus on customer needs and expectations allow, increased, uh, helped us tremendously in crystallizing uh, uh, which priorities, which feature we're bringing to market, when we are bringing to market, and why, and when, when, in which order. And in, if we look a bit deeper into that process, uh, a fundamental aspect that we have learned of that process is that it has to be uh, a true uh, two-way dialogue, uh, true uh, uh, collaboration, a partnership with uh, the customer, because um, again, as we said earlier, the technology is evolving at such a, a rapid pace. Uh, we need to be, the, as quote unquote, secret sauce in the middle, we need to n help the customer navigate all uh, and absorb all that rapid change of things that they need to absorb and implement and how to do it, when to do it, why, and so on and so forth. Right? So we need to help them mediate and navigate all that rapid change and smooth that uh, roughness that, that uh, we're still seeing for uh, such an emerging technology. And uh, uh, we learned, again, it's called leading edge for a very, very good reason. And not everybody ha has a reason or willingness to be there. And we have to understand why and focus on those that do and help th those who don't. Another important point there, which is uh, we learned it also the very hard way, is that um, 
it has to be a, a two-way dialogue. Um, and we have learned the hard way that some things were not exactly as we expected and some other things were absolutely dead wrong about. And in that situation, it was, a, uh, it was an important lesson to not to stand in our own way, right? Realize, have the intellectual honesty that we were wrong and we need to press the reset button, start again, and look things afresh from, again, having customer needs and expectations uh, first and foremost. Now, with that said, there is co-creation and there is co-creation because uh, this cartoon says there are different types of co-creations out there. So um, let me try to give you two types of, uh, uh, two examples, practical examples of customer dialogues, a, a bad one and a good one, right? Bad example, right? Custom a representative for customer calls and said, we want an exchange-based backup and archiving solution with five nines reliability. Uh, and you call me, because it's in the cloud and it's cheaper. Okay. And I'm trying to gingerly explain how the technology works and there might be other solutions out there that um, might be better suited for purpose. But then they abrupt, abrupt in, interrupt me halfway and say, well, your competition can do that, why cannot you? At which point I dropped my head and realized they are the ruling orthodox and they have the paycheck. Arguing with that does not necessarily end up well. And I dropped my head and send, give them a nice casi gateway to my object storage with redundant hardware control. And I swear on country and honor it has five nines reliability because I know they couldn't measure it if their life depended on it. <laughs> and send them on their merry way, right? And I cash the check and feel dirty, take a shower. and move on. <laughs> Good example number two, right? Uh, a brilliant customer from uh, telecom from uh, Central Europe called me up and have very clear understanding. We have this mobile device application. We have very aggressive uh, time to market uh, uh, ambition. Uh, we need Tomcat, we need Java, we need MySQL, some uh, NoSQL databases and a flexible platform to uh, deploy it as a sandbox and then the same platform to use in production. We speak to our dear friends at uh, Giga Spaces and said, check, 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 check. We speak, we speak with a customer, we enable them on our public cloud. Uh, uh, we give them a, a, um, a Cloudify environment there. And it's one of my bright spots of each every day. What can I learn from this customer today? Right? So what I'm trying to say here is that there are customers that we need to serve and carry on because the paycheck has to be there and otherwise the press will nail us to the wall that OpenStack has, hasn't any commercial adoption while at the same time enable this emerging, messy, innovating and fan fantastic new ideas that are out there and help them gingerly uh, grow into something uh, more meaningful. And with that, um, I would like to close you with this talk which I'm telling my customer and myself each day. Well, success with OpenStack is easy. The only thing that you need to do is use it like Jimi Hendrix uses his guitar. And that's <laughs> all I had to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs>